the Nikabi Diary Season 1 Illustrated Book is now available in paperback. Own your copy now by clicking the link in the description box. Assalamu alaikum. You're listening to the Nakabi Diary series by The Pen, the sound of sisters raising their voices with the written word. I'm your host Samar and thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You're listening to By The Pen, um, the sound of sisters raising their voices with the written word. And today we have Sister Uzma Jalaluddin. Sister, could you please introduce yourself for the listeners and tell us about your new book, inshallah? Sure. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm so happy to be a guest uh, on the show today. Uh, my name is Uzma Jalaluddin, and I am the author of Aisha at Last, which was my very first book published in the UK in, and uh, US in uh, the rest of the world in 2018. And my second, uh, sorry, 2019, and my second novel, Hannah Khan Carries On, will be published, publishing in April 2021. Uh, and a little bit about me, I was born and raised in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and I, uh, I've been a writer since I was a, a, a kid I, I, and a reader for even longer. Uh, my love of writing comes from my love of reading. Uh, I love fiction, nonfiction. I basically read everything, alhamdulillah. And my interest in writing was there on and off, uh, but I really became interested in pursuing novel writing um, after my second son was born and I realized, okay, it's now or never. Let me try to run after this dream that I've had since I was a child. Mashallah. Um, I also, yeah, thank you. I also work as a high school teacher uh, in my city and uh, I've been doing that for a number of years. It's a job I really enjoy. Uh, I, I work for the public school board. And then on top of that, I also write a regular parenting column in our local Toronto newspaper, the Toronto Star. It's uh, the largest circulating newspaper in Canada. Uh, I have had a byline in The Atlantic uh, and I recently started working on a play. So I'm a pretty busy person. <laughs> I have a lot of things Lots going of on. Lot. Amazing. So um, about your latest book, um, what genre is it and who is it aimed at specifically? So Hana Khan Carries On uh, is being marketed as a romantic comedy right now. Uh, and it is my, my publisher in the UK is uh, Atlantic Books, uh, Corvus. And in the US, it's Berkeley. And in Canada, it's uh, HarperCollins, HarperCollins Canada. Uh, and the target audience, I, I see this as uh, a book that is very much centered in the Muslim South Asian experience, but the uh, audience can be anyone. I, I've had any, everyone from teenagers to senior citizens of all ethnicities and all races uh, pick up my previous work and enjoy it. And I hope the same for, for this book too. If anyone is in the mood for a feel good, heartwarming story that is deeply enmeshed within a certain particular community and viewpoint of the world, uh, someone who enjoys learning about different cultures and who just really wants a laugh or who wants to see themselves represented on the page if they are South Asian or Muslim, uh, I think it would be a great book. Uh, but Hannah Khan Carries On is actually loosely inspired by uh, 1990s uh, uh, romantic comedies. So it, I, I describe it as uh, uh, it's You've Got Mail set in rival halal restaurants. Nice. Okay, cool. Mashallah, sounds really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Mashallah. So what was your inspiration for this book? Like what made you kind of want to write a rom-com? It's funny, I started writing this book in 2017 and this was before Aisha at Last was published. Uh, and the advice that writers are always given is when you're on submission and for the, for the listeners who don't know, uh, being on submission means that you have an agent and your agent is trying to you know, find editors and publishing houses who'd be interested in publishing your book. Uh, I was on submission with my first novel and the advice is always, you know, don't just sit there waiting for the rejections to roll in, write another book. And so <laughs> I thought instead of driving myself crazy waiting to see what would happen with my first book, I should get started brainstorming my second. So that was, it was sort of a distraction really. And then I, I distinctly remember this moment, I was out for uh, dinner with my husband uh, it was for my birthday and we were we were at a, a, a halal restaurant so a nice sit down kind of like a steakhouse and we were enjoying a meal and you know spending some time together and, and I looked around and I, I was just remarking to him that you know this place just didn't exist when we were kids like if we wanted to have like a halal cheeseburger or you know anything like that it would have to be homemade because you yeah. couldn't get 
halal food uh, that wasn't very ethnic. Like it, you, maybe you could get like halal tandoori chicken if you went to a certain part of the city. But the the proliferation of Zabiha and halal food has just, I, I'm sure it's the same same in many other places around the world, but in Toronto in particular, it's uh, become so common. Like my kids are growing up in a world where they're like, you know, we feel like cheeseburgers. Let's let in the, you know, there's half a dozen halal cheeseburger places available or poutine or ribs or just American fare that is available in halal. And I thought this is such a great metaphor for the way that successive waves of immigrants really change the landscape of a city and the impact that we have. Uh, the, you know, simply from like a dollar amount, like we want this type of food, we want these options available in halal, uh, as, as halal food, and it's just become an, a very accepted way of uh, eating. And it's a, it's a legitimate choice, you know, everywhere. So I thought that was really interesting. And I kind of used it as a jumping off point to explore because my book is really about, like I said, two rival halal restaurants. Mm. The first restaurant is, you know, the typical mom and pop shop that serves like your typical South Asian dishes, the biryanis and the, you know, tandoori and butter chicken and all of that. And then the the new store that opens up is the one that serves the really, you know, like the hipster food. So, yeah. you know, artisanal milkshakes <laughs> and poutine because we're Canadian. Uh, so, and, and what it, what does that mean? And how can they both coexist in a, in, in, in a very small market? So um, I always layer my stories with um, sociology and kind of uh, just, I, I always try to have a conversation about identity and really dig into the nuance of it instead of just having, you know, sort of black and white conversations. So that's one of the things that I talk about in my book. MashaAllah, very interesting. So who Thank would you. you say, like, since you're a busy mom, you obviously you work as a, as a teacher as well, and you've got a column in the newspaper, subhanAllah, like really, really busy. Who would you, who would you say was your biggest supporters while I'm um, writing your book? Oh, my husband, uh, uh, definitely. I was I've been really lucky that I have a very supportive spouse uh, from the very beginning. He's always known about my dream from even before we got married. Uh, and he's, um, he, he's helped uh, encourage me. Uh, he's my cheerleader. Uh, he helps me find time. And like today I told him, look, I'm really busy. And he's like, all right, what are we having for dinner? I'm going to cook. So <laughs> just little <laughs> things like that. Yeah. You need, I think you need, you need, it's, it's really important for, for women, I think, when you're pursuing your dream to have that support system and, and different people will find it in different ways. But I, I've been very blessed to have a very supportive spouse who takes my dream seriously and understands how important it is to me. Um, my parents have been very supportive as well. Uh, but, you know, the person I, I live with in, in the day to day that says, OK, don't bug mom, close the door, you know, go into your office. Just, you know, uh, this is important is is definitely my husband. And it, it, it also helps that my children are older. They're not yeah. babies because I you can't really say, OK, listen, toddler, go away. You know, yeah. so my, my kids are teenagers and, and they still need a lot of attention, but they also under, are old enough to understand and be busy with their own things. Uh, and understand that, you know, I do need time to devote to this because I, I, it's, it's important to me and uh, they respect that more or less. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, that's great. So what would you say your biggest challenge was while writing? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> um, my first novel took about eight years to finish. Only wow. Because I, yeah, really long time. Uh, and, and it wasn't because I was writing every day. And in fact, it was because I, I was wearing so many hats. I was working. Yeah. Every, high school teacher, which is a really a job that just takes up a lot of time. And at the time I had very young children. So I would write a f for a few months and then I would put it aside because, you know, life got busy and then I'd come back to it maybe six months later and keep going. And then, uh, so there were a lot of starts and stops mm. and there wasn't, you know, there wasn't anyone really waiting for me to finish the book either. It was just, it was at that time, it was a hobby. Uh, it was a dream. And it, in fact, it was a secret dream. I, I think one of the reasons why I didn't, uh, why it took so long to finish was because I, I couldn't even admit to myself that I wanted I wanted this that I wanted to be a writer uh, because I was already doing so many things I was I was already a mother a wife a daughter a teacher uh, my life was was full but mm -hmm. I, I wanted more and sometimes I think as as Muslims as women we aren't really uh, encouraged to keep go running after dreams after a certain point uh, so so there was the time factor there was the ambition factor uh, the other issue was I I didn't really know anyone in publishing I had one friend of mine who who had published some children's novels, but I was writing in adult fiction. It's a very different, yeah. uh, very different process. 
So, you know, just, just simply the fact that there aren't uh, a, a lot of um, Muslim South Asian writers at the time when I was writing in the early, you know, 2010 to 2017 was when I was writing Aisha at last. Um, even someone to turn to, to say, okay, this is how it works. This is what you need. You need an agent. This is how you get an agent. You need a publisher. This is how you get a publisher. Um, I did have another friend who was sort of on the same path as me. So we were sort of educating ourselves and trying to figure things out together. So, you know, it comes back to a lack of representation in literature. So lots of things were um, working against me, but Alhamdulillah, I think it was meant to be. And I, I worked really hard and I had the right people around me at the time. Uh, and it, it happened and my first book was published and it's been, it's been a fantastic experience so far. I'm, I'm very blessed, Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, mashallah. So what would you say um, was the message um, of this book that you're trying to get across? Is there any specific kind of message that you've got in, in the story, in the storyline? Uh, like I said, the, the premise is um, rival halal restaurants and, you know, um, you've got me alone in rival halal restaurants, that sort of thing. But that's sort of the, the setup for it. What it's really about is about uh, a young woman named Hannah Khan. Uh, she's in her early 20s and she basically is trying to navigate her existence as a hijab wearing young Muslim woman in Toronto. And, and what does that feel like? What does that look like? It really gets into, she's a, she's a broadcaster. So um, she actually has a podcast in the book, which is, which is fun. Uh, and it, so it's really fun to be on a, a podcast right now. So she, <laughs> <laughs> it's life imitating art. Uh, she is, uh, but she's an anonymous uh, podcaster. So she, she posts sort of like a self-reflective diary about her experiences living in this space in trying to navigate, you know, trying to trying to get a job, being the daughter of uh, someone who has run a restaurant for 15 years and her, her parents are really struggling. There's some health challenges. And then this new restaurant moves in and it's a, sort of like a corporate setup, a very slick type of hipster modernist vibe to it. And it really just threatens her livelihood. And she feels very threatened by this. And on top of that, she's trying to make her way and get a steady staple job in broadcasting. Uh, while helping her parents in the restaurant. So there's she, she's feeling sort of attacked on multiple levels and how how does she find her place in this world? And then to complicate matters, there's a hate attack that occurs in her neighborhood. And she lives in a very uh, immigrant, rich, diverse neighborhood mm. uh, 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 in, in Scarborough. So anyone, any listeners who are familiar, Toronto has many different suburbs. One of them is Scarborough and Scarborough is known as uh, sort of the melting pot like there's people from all over the world who live here she lives in a very diverse neighborhood in the east end of toronto called scarborough and uh, there's a hate attack on her in in her neighborhood and that really shakes her and rattles her because she realizes that they're on top of the challenges that she's facing as a, a young up-and-coming um visible muslim woman uh there are other forces outside of her control that are also uh, attacking her and that she has to confront so she's got a lot going on, but ultimately, and it, it, it is a really funny story. It's also a story about family. She's got extended family who sort of come and visit her from India. And she has, you know, she, she gets to know her a little bit more about her, her family, her family stories, uh, her heritage, and uh, all of this while she's, you know, falling in love for the first time. So mm. that there's a love story as well. It's a very halal love story, I should add. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, that sounds really amazing. Okay, so um, Thank you. What, what advice would you give to other Muslim women who feel that they have a story to tell, whether it's, you know, like a personal story or a fiction or something that is, you know, a non-fiction book even, what advice would you give them if they're just kind of starting out on their journey of writing a book? Oh my goodness. Um, I would say it's really important to, uh, so there's, there's a couple of pieces of advice. Uh, writing a book is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It will, it is, it is the work of several years. Um, especially when you're first trying to break into the market, it's, uh, it, it's something that will take you a while. Spend time on your words. Don't rush. Um, the beauty of writing, in my opinion, comes out in rewriting. Your first draft will always be terrible, and that's fine. That first draft is for you to figure out the story. And the real story comes in the multiple drafts that follow, especially when you're writing something as long as a book. Uh, my first draft, uh, my very first novel, and again, to spend many years, 
uh, I probably wrote dozens of drafts I, and I have like 10 or 15 of them that I show sometimes when I go to uh, when I Panama. used to go for class visits and <laughs> workshops and, and when we all when we did things like this live in person um, you know just just complete rewrites some, some of them were page one throw everything out start from the beginning rewrites and, and my story took shape from there and even my second novel I am I am definitely a drafter I had seven to ten drafts of uh, Hannah Khan carries on because each each layer each draft unearths a different layer of character or of story so be patient with yourself, be patient with the words, work on your craft. You cannot be a writer if you are not a reader. You have to read in order to write. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to read widely, in my opinion, read uh, within your genre as well as a whole bunch of other genres. Uh, constantly be immersed in the written word. And the other important thing is to sur surround yourself and ha have some kind of a writing community because writing is very, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll say that again. Uh, the other thing is to surround yourself with the writing community. Writing is a very lonely hobby or profession or whatever where, whatever stage you're at. And uh, I know for me, it was so important to have that connection with a few writer friends. I have a couple of writer friends that I'm very close to. And just being able to share like, oh, I got this email today or, oh, my editor said this. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really different. We, we call, uh, one of my friends says, it's like a, like a staff room. So uh, because we're, I'm a teacher, I, I really... I really got that. Like in your staff room, you have a safe space where you can like talk about your job and know that you're not going to be judged necessarily. And that's really important with writing too. Okay, alhamdulillah. Mashallah, that sounds like very comprehensive advice. <laughs> Thank you. Mashallah. Covered all the bases there. Alhamdulillah. Okay, well, Thank you. so where can we find your book? Uh, so my book is available, uh, will be available in April uh, and it is available for pre-order. Uh, everywhere. So you can find it at your local indie bookstores. You can find it online uh, through uh, Google Books, Apple Books, through Amazon. It's uh, hopefully it'll be available in bookstores in person by April, but who knows. Uh, but please do, if you're interested, if the book sounds sounds uh, fascinating, please do pre-order. It, it sends a message to publishers that there are people who are interested in these stories and want yeah. to support these stories. It's a huge, huge thing for publishers to see that. Otherwise, to be frank, they'll just stop publishing these books and these yeah. uh, diverse stories that come in all, all different forms uh, will will not be supported. So we'd really appreciate that. And and if if you have, and of course, uh, all of these books are available through public libraries. I love public libraries. So yeah. by all means, uh, tell your public library that you want to read this book and they will buy a copy and that helps as well. And the biggest thing, of course, is after you have purchased it or borrowed it or read it, please do uh, tell your friends if you liked it. If you hated it, that's fine, too. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. <laughs> uh, please do write reviews on Goodreads and Amazon and things like that. That really helps. Okay, Jazakallah khair. I think, we'll, inshallah, we'll put the links in the description. And the yeah, that would be great. Box. Thank you. So that people yeah. can easily get access to your books, inshallah, both of them, actually, because I think, um, you know, they both sound interesting. Obviously, we didn't talk so much about the other book, but oh, it's okay. Worth, um, they're definitely worth having a read, inshallah, especially for people who are interested in fiction, Islamic fiction, yeah. inshallah. Yeah, for sure. Yes, we'll put the links in the description and this could be sure. a good gift, everybody. So if you're listening just have it kind of on your list of things because obviously with the yeah. amount of time that people are spending at home these days you know people have time for reading books and things like that at least it's a way to maybe as well get get away from the technology for a little bit just take time exactly out read a book yeah sure. yeah yeah it's, it's a nice rest for your brain uh for from all the screens that's right definitely definitely okay jazakallah khair sister for joining us today and telling us about your wonderful um new book that's coming out and sharing your advice with us for um, budding uh, authors. Uh, really of course, thank you for time. having me. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was wonderful. And assalamu alaikum, everyone. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.